welcome. Today, we're going to talk about postpartum depression screening. What next? I'm Dr. Julia Wood. I'm a psychiatrist in private practice in Knoxville, Tennessee. I completed medical school at Vanderbilt University and then went on to complete my psychiatry residency at Harvard's combined program at Massachusetts General Hospital and McLean Hospital. While in residency, I spent additional time with the perinatal psychiatry group, focusing on the treatment of women during pregnancy and the postpartum. And since completing training, I have continued to focus my practice on pregnant and postpartum individuals and have been active in the Tennessee chapter of Postpartum Support International, which is an organization with resources for both providers as well as patients and families. And I'll be sharing more about these resources later in my talk today. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or ACOG, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics and Postpartum Support International, all recommend that we screen all patients during the comprehensive postpartum visit for depression with a validated tool. ACOG also states that, quote, there's evidence that screening alone can have clinical benefits, although initiation of treatment or referral to mental health care providers offers maximum benefit. And also that clinical staff in obstetrics and gynecology practices should be prepared to initiate medical therapy, refer patients to appropriate behavioral health resources when indicated, or both. And if you are here today, I'm guessing that you likely do screen your patients, and you likely are offering first-line treatment with an antidepressant like sertraline or escitalopram, and you likely are referring patients for additional treatment, but you're giving me this look because it's not working as well as you would hope. And your sense about the situation is backed up by evidence. So I wanna share with you the results of a study of women in New Zealand. Now this study involved 400 women, but for the ease of wrapping our heads around the numbers, I'm gonna extrapolate the data to 1,000 women. So this study screened women during the postpartum period for depression and offered patients free treatment via therapy. So let's take a look at the 1,000 women that they screened. 130 women screened positive for depression. This is 13% of women, which is about what we would expect. Unfortunately, of these 130 women who screen positive for depression, less than a third of them, in other words, 40 women, agreed to be contacted. Now, this was a psychotherapy study, so perhaps women didn't want to engage in therapy as treatment, or perhaps they didn't want to enter a study where they might be randomized to a less effective treatment, but this one-third number is in line with other studies. As many as two-thirds of women who screen positive for depression will decline treatment. So in any case, of the 40 women who agreed to treatment, only about half of them, 18 women, attended the initial assessment. And of these, only five actually entered the study and started treatment. So again, of the 130 women screening positive, you get five. So just 4% of women entering treatment in this study. I know that you are here because you want to do better than this. So today, we're gonna to talk about three things. First, we'll cover the why and the how of screening. Then, we'll talk about systems that do work. And finally, we'll talk about what you can do today to help your patients. So first, the why and the how of screening. So why do we screen? Screening itself may reduce stigma, but we're really screening to improve outcomes for mothers and babies. So we're screening to identify depression and to treat depression with the understanding that treating maternal depression will have trickle-down effects to baby. This is important because perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are common, are treatable, and treating depression in mothers can improve outcomes for children. So first, what are the perinatal mood and anxiety disorders? Let's review these briefly. Keep in mind that the postpartum period is the highest risk time in a woman's life for developing a mood or anxiety disorder. These illnesses are very common. As many as one in five will develop a mood or anxiety disorder in the first year postpartum. Postpartum depression is the most common of the perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. 
and it can overlap with other anxiety disorders. In fact, often anxiety is the most pervasive symptom of postpartum depression. So women may not identify with feeling sad or depressed, but they can't enjoy themselves or relax due to high anxiety. So they'll often also have changes in sleep or appetite, energy, and may have thoughts of being better off dead, thoughts that their family would be better off without them, or have thoughts of suicide. They may struggle to feel bonded to their baby due to their symptoms. In postpartum obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, patients may have intrusive worries about harm befalling baby. A parent may fear baby being injured, not receiving enough food, suddenly stopping breathing, and parents can have a fear of themselves harming the baby and may see images of themselves throwing the baby, dropping the baby, or inappropriately touching the baby sexually. These experiences tend to be extremely distressing. Compulsions may or may not be present, and the intrusive images and worries can be so upsetting that some parents may not want to be around baby for fear of harming him or her. However, it should be noted that mothers with OCD who have intrusive images of harming their babies are not actually at risk of harming them. Women with a history of bipolar disorder are at high risk of relapse into a mood disorder postpartum. Most commonly, mothers will experience depressive episodes, but mania or postpartum psychosis may also occur. Postpartum psychosis is rare, but it is an emergency and requires urgent evaluation and treatment. Postpartum psychosis is characterized by delusions, often paranoia or hallucinations, and a decreased need for sleep. Sometimes women will appear confused or have difficulty communicating, and the risk of suicide and infanticide is increased in postpartum psychosis. There's a 5% suicide rate and a 4% infanticide rate. So while the majority of women experiencing postpartum psychosis do not harm themselves or anyone else, the elevated risk requires we take swift action to get women the help they need. The perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are, all, are also treatable. So SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, are first line for depression and anxiety, and they are safe in breastfeeding. In OCD, patients may need higher doses at the higher end of the approved range. So for example, 200 milligrams of sertraline or 20 milligrams of escitalopram. And medicine may take longer, up to eight weeks, to fully take effect. Sleep, while hard to come by for new parents, is crucial to focus on in postpartum depression. Improving sleep in and of itself can be a helpful treatment for depression. So we should be helping patients find ways that they can get a consolidated chunk of sleep while making sure that baby is tended to while they rest. Support groups can also be helpful for parents with postpartum depression. Postpartum Support International has online free support groups available on its website at postpartum.net. Psychotherapy is an evidence-based treatment for postpartum depression as well. And both cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal therapy have been studied in postpartum depression. Again, Postpartum Support International has a list of providers who have completed their training and have expertise in perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. These providers are listed on the PSI website at postpartum.net. Another organization I'd encourage you to be aware of is AIM High Tennessee, or the Association for Infant Mental Health in Tennessee. This organization focuses on educating and training providers working with caregivers, keeping the caregiver child dyad in mind. Therapists who have received training through AIM High Tennessee are another group of individuals who can be a good resource for our patients. And as I stated earlier, one of the reasons we screen and treat postpartum depression is that we seek to improve outcomes, not just in maternal health, but in infant health. So a number of years ago, a large multi-site trial named STAR-D, which stands for the Sequence Treatment Alternatives to Relieve Depression, was done. And this study used an algorithm to treat people with depression, and it attempted to treat as many people to remission as possible looking at the effectiveness of various treatments along the way. And as part of this study, mothers and their children were interviewed to see if treating mothers had any impact on the psychiatric symptoms of their children. 151 mothers and their offspring were a part of this study. So 151 mother-child pairs. Mothers who had remission of their depression over the course of the year-long study had children who got better as they got better. 
and children of mothers who did not have remission of illness had no improvement in their psychiatric symptoms, suggesting that in this study, simply treating mothers resulted in improvement in the outcome of children. Does this seem too good to be true? Perhaps it is. Where other studies have also found that treating mothers improves the outcome of children, not all studies have found this to be true. It may be that some parents need more than simply treatment for their depression. And there have been numerous programs looking at therapies that also focus on parenting behaviors. Home visiting programs have been adapted to include cognitive behavioral therapy components in order to address both maternal depression as well as to enhance the quality of parenting provided. Triple P is another program that has been studied in mothers of toddlers and preschool age children that has added cognitive behavioral therapy skills to establish therapies aimed at enhancing parenting skills. And when studied, these types of treatments have been found to improve parenting, reduce maternal depression, and to prevent negative outcomes in children's behavior. So it really does appear that by treating maternal mood disorders, we can improve outcomes for children. So let's talk about screening tools. The two most commonly used tools for screening for depression include the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, or the EPDS, and the nine-item Patient Health Questionnaire, or the PHQ-9. Both can be administered either in writing, with the patient filling it out themselves, or by having a provider ask the questions directly. Both the EPDS and the PHQ-9 have established cutoff scores for a positive screen, and for a severity range, which can help you decide what to do next. And I will come back to that in a short bit. But first, let's talk about the challenge of bipolar disorder. So if you have a patient who screens positive for postpartum depression, the next step is to ask more questions, running through the symptoms of depression, ensuring that your patient is in an episode of depression. However, Knowing your patient is in an episode of depression does not tell you whether your patient has major depression, otherwise known as unipolar depression, or if your patient has bipolar disorder. And unfortunately, it can be challenging to make the distinction. And because unipolar depression and bipolar depression typically respond to different treatments, the distinction is important. But short of having a skilled and experienced psychiatric provider in your practice, there is not a simple solution to this problem. A number of studies and programs have introduced the Mood Disorder Questionnaire, or the MDQ, in an attempt to weed out bipolar disorder. However, the sensitivity and the specificity of the MDQ limit it somewhat. The MDQ is a 13-item questionnaire, and as you can see here, the questionnaire asks about periods of time where an individual may have had elevated mood or irritable mood, decreased need for sleep, racing thoughts, more talkativeness, more reckless behavior, such as spending money. A cutoff score of seven plus an answer of yes to question two, which basically asks if the symptoms occurred at the same time, as well as an indication that the symptoms cause moderate to severe impairment, is a positive screen on the MDQ. The sensitivity and specificity of the MDQ has varied across studies. In primary care settings, it has often be found, been found to be more specific than it is sensitive, as you can see here. Lowering the cutoff score, of course, increases sensitivity, but then it lowers specificity. A recent study looking at the positive predictive value of the mood disorder questionnaire in the general population found a positive predictive value of just 43%, showing that the questionnaire picks up many false positives. And a recent review this year in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry by Masters et al. found that in women with no psychiatric history who were screened with the MDQ postpartum, up to 25% in some studies screen positive for bipolar disorder. However, studies that used a standard diagnostic assessment given by a trained interviewer found that less than 3% of women met criteria for bipolar disorder. So again, the MDQ may be one way to screen out patients at higher risk of bipolar disorder, though its specificity in a perinatal population may not be as high as in other populations.
So let's talk about systems that work. Can we simply screen and refer for psychiatric follow-up? That does not appear to be effective on its own. So what does work? So Dr. Laura Miller, who's a perinatal psychiatrist, developed a program to increase uptake of psychiatric treatment in women who screen positive on the PHQ-9. In this study, all patients were screened on site and were evaluated the same visit for postpartum depression. So a trained clinician saw all people who screened positive to make a diagnosis of depression. Of note, these patients were also screened for bipolar disorder using the MDQ. Patients were then stratified to different pathways depending on the severity of their depression. And the majority of the treatment was provided on site, including cognitive behavioral therapy. And clinical staff were trained to discuss diagnosis and treatment, to elicit patients' reactions, concerns, and treatment preferences. Staff also introduced self-care kits that included self-guided cognitive behavioral therapy exercises. And additionally, a social worker was on site to be introduced to patients early on and to conduct cognitive behavioral therapy where appropriate. So in this study, 90% of patients who were diagnosed with depression entered treatment. This is compared to the usual 33% we find in studies of people even willing to accept treatment, let alone following through with treatment. So the findings here were really promising. Of course, such a program is resource heavy, and many states have developed programs to support OB providers with diagnosis and treatment patients with depression during pregnancy and the postpartum. So 14 states now have perinatal access projects, which range in the way that they provide treatment. Massachusetts has a program called MCPAP for Moms, or MCPAP for Moms. And this program serves as a model for many others. It has numerous resources online, including treatment algorithms. And in this program, an OB is able to talk in real time to a perinatal psychiatrist for advice. And if the psychiatrist finds the patient to need further psychiatric assessment, a one-time virtual consult can be done by the psychiatrist with the patient virtually, with recommendations then being sent back to the OB for further treatment. It is my ultimate hope that we could develop systems across Tennessee to support our OB providers in caring for the mental health of pregnant and postpartum women. But until then, how can I help my patients today? First, of course, screen. We need to make screening universal. Ideally, once during pregnancy and at six weeks postpartum, two weeks for people at high risk. Every practice needs a system to manage positive screens. A positive screen should be addressed on the same day as the screen is done. And a clinician should make further inquiries to make a diagnosis of depression, then discuss treatment recommendations, ideally based on severity of illness, as was done in Dr. Miller's study. So let's come back to that study, and I'll share what was recommended for patients based on severity of symptoms. So in Dr. Miller's study, patients with subsyndromal symptoms, so less than the mild category, were provided with printed materials that focused on self-guided cognitive behavioral therapy and self-care. Mild depression was treated with medication, as well as the printed materials. Moderate depression was treated with medication, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy, which was provided in that study by a therapist on site. These patients were also provided with the self-care materials. And severe symptoms or a positive screen for bipolar disorder were treated with medication off-site by a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner, as well as with cognitive behavioral therapy on site. So clearly, some patients you simply will need to refer out for treatment due to either the severity of their illness uh, or their illness history. Please keep in mind, women with a history of psychiatric treatment are more likely to follow up with an outside referral. It is your patients without psychiatric history or previous treatment who will be the most important to try to capture in your office or to really work with to overcome barriers to seeking treatment offsite. So as much as possible, start treatment in your office. Your patient has formed a bond with you and your clinical staff over the course of pregnancy. They are more likely to listen to you and feel that you care about them than they are to listen to someone they do not have an established relationship with. And in addition to recommending medication, you'll want to tell your patient why you recommend this and what to expect in terms of side effects, 
benefits, timeline of when things might get better, and what to do if they have side effects, and what other options are available if they don't like the option that you have offered. So what I tell people is, this is depression, and it can get better. Your symptoms are significant enough that I think that the best thing to do is to treat with medication. It can help you feel better, faster. And whatever medication you take, I am not asking you to take this for the rest of your life. If it does help and you tolerate it well, we usually ask you to continue medication for some time between six months to a year after you feel better. And when medication works, like it's supposed to, people say that things just roll off them easier or that they feel more themselves. In terms of side effects, the most common side effects people have are nausea, sometimes diarrhea when you start on the medication. If this happens, it tends to get better within a few days, up to a week. It's also possible for this medication to cause weight gain. Though most people do not gain large amounts of weight on these medications. And if you do start to gain weight on this medication, I want you to let me know because I don't want you to be gaining a lot of weight on this. If medication is not doing what it's supposed to do or if it's causing you side effects that are problematic, we can talk about that. We can talk about other, other options. We can stop the medication. If you have the resources, following up with a phone call a few days after the appointment to check in to see if patients have picked up their medicine, started medicine, or are having any issues can be really helpful. In my office, we have the ability to securely text patients. And this has been a wonderful way to check in with people to see how they're doing, to provide cheerleading, reassurance, or further resources. And of course, questions may come up about medication as you're treating patients. So for example, a patient may have taken a medication in the past and want to restart it, but you may not feel as if you know enough about that particular medication to do so. It could be a true gift to your patient to restart a medication that has been helpful for them in the past and to bridge them to an appointment with a psychiatric provider who can continue to treat them. Postpartum Support International has a consultation line for prescribing clinicians to call with questions about medication during pregnancy and the postpartum period. This service is free of charge. And while it is not set up as a hotline, like it is in the Massachusetts program, you will be able to speak with a perinatal psychiatrist within two business days and essentially get a consultation on your patient. Medication is, of course, just one piece. It's important to share other resources, such as psychotherapy, support groups, and to stress the importance of sleep in recovering from an episode of depression. While you may be limited in your ability to create some systems of care, perhaps you could increase the patients you help on site by hosting a support group for postpartum depression. Perhaps your hospital could host one, or maybe you could partner with Postpartum Support International to find someone to hold a group and offer space for free. The more we can do to offer treatment and support where people are already coming for care, the better. And the more we can keep the door open for those who may be initially reluctant to accept treatment, the more likely they will be to ask for help when they're ready. So in that vein, patients can be provided with resources as well. Postpartum Support International has a warm line that people can text or call to receive support or to be connected with local resources. Please share this number widely with your patients who scream positive for depression. Even if they're not ready for treatment today, hanging on to that number may allow them to have somewhere to call when they are ready. So in closing, I want to ask you all in addition to screening, treating, and referring your patients for care to advocate for more robust systems in Tennessee. There are numerous examples of state access programs that we could build off of with the proper funding and leadership. I look forward to a time when we can all provide our patients with more comprehensive and coordinated care for the treatment of mood and anxiety disorders. Thank you so much for your time today.